finding possibility in what might seem impossible. I studied at Reading University uh, between 1984 and 1988 and then about six months afterwards I went to um, Mexico, Mexico City, with a group of English art students, really none of us were artists, so we were all coming out of art college from Winchester and Reading with the idea of, of being outside of Europe for a few months at least to do a kind of self-initiated residency. We all liked it so much that we all stayed uh, longer periods of time. Uh, and then I stayed for a much longer period of time, mm -hmm. 24, 25 years now. I think it was a very interesting moment there, beginning of the 90s. There were several artists that had been away for studying away outside Mexico who kept, were coming back. And then there were several uh, foreign artists who were also uh, living there was, or just starting to kind of root themselves there. I had a, a very small cafe called Mel's Cafe, which I started with uh, Francis Elise at uh, the beginning of the 90s. And that also was uh, some kind of uh, meeting point for, or informal meeting point for younger artists and uh, foreigners and locals uh, all at the same time. It was my studio which I converted into a, this kind of clandestine cafe for just 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 Sundays, you know. We used to show a lot in our uh, different studios. Um, it was kind of improvised. But I think this was also what caused some kind of freshness, you know. There was real, really no market there at the time. I think there was, you know, there was this sort of urgency or sensation that Something had to be said, and also something uh, had to be generated. Uh, so there was uh, this real kind of um, very genuine, I think, <laughs> energy, which, which may be hard to find now, you know. Uh, Mexico itself is very Baroque, very different from, uh, I guess, the, the formation that I'd had as an artist, where I was really interested in minimalism. So. Really going to Mexico gave me this 180 degree shift in my interests and, and work, you know. Uh, going to this completely different, excessive, uh, saturated culture was, was, was uh, attractive and at the same time repellent. And I think that comes across a lot in early works, like Orange Lush, for example. Something that I'm interested in is some, where is that kind of meeting point or is there a meeting point between minimalism and surrealism? Or is that possible? In Mexico, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a, there are many uh, surreal events uh, in everyday life. Uh, somehow, you know, you you always throw, uh, part of you is always from where you come from, even if you live somewhere else. There's always this kind of duality about where you are from and where you where you are living, and that and that sensation within you, I think from my experience of talking with other people as well, is it, it, it doesn't ever really go, you just learn to deal with it. You're always kind of on the edge, you know, somehow. And I think, uh, that's, you know, Mexico City is a very raw place to, to live. You know? So there's always this sort of notion that progress in Latin America has, has seemed uh, impossible through corruption, through political, social problematics that arise. Um, and that is what makes it somehow, in, in many eyes, has been seen as, as a failed modernity. But what I, my work introduces somehow is that this, these, these, these are not failures. They're, this kind of precariousness of life is part of life. This somehow, perhaps even non-rational, non-functional way of understanding the world is something which opens up some kind of possibility. I think my work is kind of under, uh, uncovering and finding some kind of potential in all those messed up uh, kind of uh, under, uh, situations. Huh? In Mexico, I, I kind of learned that um, this very kind of formal, abstract work which I had been doing as a student 
just didn't really seem to function there did, because there you cannot avoid this kind of crude reality of the political situation, the social situation, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the many very kind of raw experiences that you can that you have in the city. You know, a city filled with poverty, a city filled with pollution, a city filled with many political problems. For me, my question was, you know, what what sense does it make to just be making formal abstract work? It didn't. So I was always kind of constantly looking for these kind of mechanisms behind the kind of duality between this, this kind of, um, I think what some of our artists have, have we've come to call it kind of corrupted minimalism now uh, where you know there's this 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 trying to un, un, unleverage uncover uh, what what is behind the surface somehow uh, how do we see things from uh, or the world from um, as, a, as an artist or a subject from 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 both sides and I think that this is how in a way my my work has developed of understanding modernity not in this terms of the, the black and white about us and them and you know I think we all know that that doesn't somehow work anymore so my work has been it's I think it's about understanding somehow these complexities or idiosyncrasies of of both places um, in Hilitla what I was trying to do was set up a kind of constellation of ideas which have historical and art historical levels. But I was also trying to understand what, uh, or look at what Hilitla could mean to us as a contemporary site now. And what could we uh, learn, in a sense, from that building an, a non-functional, non-rational, kind of emotional architecture? How could we see that again as this is as some kind of alternative to this functionalist rationalist systems in which we live in uh, i was taking edward james's garden as a premise for the film this reason why james would build a ruin almost <laughs> why would he build a place that was for himself essentially that was uh, he was he was building it with the idea of the nature falling into or collapsing the structures and why would he go all the way over to 10 hours out of Mexico City to build this almost this homage to himself, in a sense? There was a lot of Robert Smithson in the film, there's Dan Flavin, there's surrealism, there's huge tension between sound and image. So that this is, it's almost like it's constantly throwing the viewer, in my mind, into a sort of present state where as soon as you think you've understood something, you're, you're kind of led into another narrative and then woven back into the same one. And so it's this sort of spiral again of, of ideas that don't, less, don't have a linear narrative. Para coordenação, em Fordlandia, nas coordenadas 05 graus e 50 no sul. Fordlandia is more about um, sort of finding a horizontality between the animal world, the machine, and the human world. That was why I was really focusing on this, these small twitches and eyes or noses or breathing of an animal. Henry Ford, who made this place, Fordlandia, during the 1920s as a, as a rubber factory, um, he bought an American workforce, he bought an Ameri American housing, he bought uh, American machinery down there, um, put millions of dollars into this project, but mostly due to the resistance of nature, um, he found that he couldn't, he couldn't, he just couldn't make this, this project work. He, he basically created this dystopian project, and so my interest there was, was like I say, trying to put on a sort of horizontal level the way in which animal, machine, humans function in this sort of same ontological level. How could we think of the animal as some kind of uh, potential in a way for thinking in the present? Animals are so locked up in their presentness 
And this was a project that was so much about progress, so much about industrial development and so much about future. How could we as humans be contented in our own presentness?